Thanks, Mike. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another session of Broken Bread. This is study 21 in the studies that we've called To the Churches of Galatia. I don't know how many studies this is going to go to if you're asking that question. Whatever you're listening to, you're very welcome from, you're very welcome, and uh, we trust you'll be blessed as we share some of these things together. I have kind of bumped into people from time to time who tell me that they're listening to these, so that's encouraging, and uh, it's always good to hear how you're making out with what we're doing. Okay, so this is study number one, at uh, 21, and it has the single one-word title, Beloved, with an exclamation mark behind it. Beloved. I want to talk again about Paul, about this man, and about his relationship with the churches in Galatia, because this letter from Paul comes out of a relationship. This isn't someone sitting at the top of a big multi-dimensional company somewhere who is sending out emails and telling people what to do. This is someone who has um, an intimate relationship with these people to whom he's writing, and they have a history. He and they together have a history, and it's out of that relationship that this letter comes. That really is a key thing to try to get um, a grip of when we're looking at the letters for, of Paul and Peter and others in the New Testament, to understand that they're writing, generally anyway, they're writing to people with whom they have a relationship. So you need to presume that. Um, and it's it's interesting with Paul. Um, in his letters, he uh, nearly always kind of starts off with some little introduction which says uh, something like, what would he say? Uh, something like um, he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ or is something like that or he's called to be an apostle. Um, and these aren't just, um, they're not random and, and they're not just standard because if you look at carefully at his letters, you'll discover that they vary a lot. And I like to think of these, these are Paul's self-conscious self introductions. In other words, he has a certain role in mind, a relationship in mind, and he's writing from it. I think maybe my favorite of all these little introductions is the letter to the Romans, where Paul just simply says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, separated to the gospel of God. And I think that those two Labels those two descriptions, a bond servant, that's to say a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, really give us the explanation to the extraordinary dynamic of this man. He could speak with tremendous authority, uh, but at the same time he had a, a, a wonderful heart of compassion. And he didn't have a sense of a status that lifted him high above other people. He regarded himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. On one occasion when he wrote to the, Christ, uh, to the Christians at Corinth, he described himself as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. But at the same time, he knew that he had a responsibility that God had given to him. He knew that he had an authority, so he speaks also as an apostle. So you need to keep those two things together. This isn't someone... This isn't a pompous dictator kind of issuing diktats. This is someone who has a relationship and also a, conscious, a consciousness of responsibility under God for the care of these people. So in all those different epistles, you've got um, different sorts of things. Paul and Timothy, uh, he describes himself and Timothy as bond servants of Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes there are no labels at all. Uh, when he writes to the Thessalonians, he just simply says, Paul... Silvanus and Timothy. On other occasions, and there's this famous one, of course, the bond servant of Jesus Christ. I want us to look at Paul and um, see if we can kind of identify his character. Now, let's start off with the evidence then, and we'll start off with his critics. It's not a bad thing sometimes to listen to what the critics have to say. When Paul was in Athens in Acts chapter 17, he was at a place called the Areopagus. This was where the philosophers used to gather and they would give their learned dissertations and it very 
uh, able speakers. They practiced and trained in rhetoric uh, and in the, the way of kind of expressing things. And then Paul turns up in the middle of these, uh, you might say, kind of university philosophers. And it says this in Acts chapter 17. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. That little uh, word, the babbler, what does this babbler want to say? It, it, it's actually... Uh, a better word to babble would actually be, what is he twittering on about? Because this word that they use actually means to pick up little seeds. You know, we, we've got a, a family of dunnocks at the bottom of our garden. There must be about, oh, a dozen, 15 of them. And they never stop picking up tiny, invisible things. And they come to the, uh, the bird feeders and they feed there as well. And some people were saying of Paul, he's, he's, he's just like a little sparrow. He's just he's picked up some bits and pieces from here and there and he's put them all together. He's got nothing substantial to say. So that's what they thought about him as um, a competitor for the attentions of the people on Mars Hill or Areopagus. Now, he's another one. Uh, this is uh, other of his critics again. And this is uh, something that he himself recalls Paul. Uh, he says, this is what his critics are saying of him, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, let's divide those up. This, this is Paul reporting what people are saying of him. His letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. So even the people who didn't like him recognized that in the things that he was saying, there was an authority, there was a weight, there was a substance to it. But they said, he is not much to look at. His bodily presence is weak. In fact, there's a very old description of Paul. Someone was sent to the quayside to meet him and were given a description to look for a man who was small in stature, uh, bald, his eyebrows met in the middle, he has a large nose, he's slightly stooped, and he has bowed legs. But he's very gracious, they said. Um, so there's your, dis your description of Paul. His bodily presence is weak. This man is not a TV personality. He's not someone who would instantly have gathered lots of people around to his program or to his YouTube things. He's, he's just an ordinary guy and maybe not much to look at at all. And then they say this. And his speech is contemptible. What they're really implying is that he just isn't much of a speaker, is he? He's, uh, he, he, he's not someone you'd go to listen to just to enjoy his skill, his rhetoric, his power of presenting arguments. So they didn't think a great deal about him. So he's not doing very well so far. His critics think he's, he's like a little twittering bird who's picked up a few seeds from somewhere, gathered them together. In other words, he's just a plagiarist. He's got nothing original to say. It's just a mixture. It's a pick-and-mix uh, philosophy that he's got from somewhere. And then these others who say, well, his later is a weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, now the thing is, and this is important for us to re realize, that we, you and I, that is, we only ever meet Paul through his letters. You never see the look in his eye. Uh, you've never met him. You've never uh, seen him in action. You've only met his letters. And remember what his critics said about his letters. They are weighty and powerful. So from his letters, you get an idea you know, of someone who is weighty, powerful, uh, an authority figure, someone who lays the law down, tells people what to do, and yet that isn't the impression that people had of him who saw him in the flesh. They say in this flesh, well, his bodily presence is weak, and is speaking contemptible. So remember that what we are seeing is Paul, the inspired writer of Scripture, and there is an authority coming through his letters that you might not have recognized at all in the same way if you had heard him preach or speak. That's Maybe I'll say something of that uh, just very briefly. 
one of the problem of much modern ministry, I think, is that we produce platform performers and we never get to know the man. But unless you can get to know the man, you can't have a relationship with him. And if you don't have a relationship, you don't have the kind of interconnectivity that you have in Paul's letters. So what about his friends? What did they say about him? Well, um, this is what the apostles said of him. I love this thing. This is Acts chapter 15, verse 23. Uh, you remember that this is when they were having this discussion about um, the Gentiles and whether or not they needed to keep the law. And when they'd come to their conclusion, the Holy Spirit brought them to unanimity. Wonderful phenomena, that is. And the Holy Spirit brought them to unanimity, and then they decided that they would write a letter. And this is the letter. It says, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, this is the letter, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you. These are actually leading men, as re they refer to. These are chosen men to you. And then it says this, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. This word we're going to come to again and again, beloved. Listen to the affection with which they refer to him and Barnabas in this letter. Our beloved brother Barnabas and Paul. So if you've got the idea that Paul is an austere, distant character, listen to some of his friends. This is our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And then it says this, Men who have, the old King James Version said, hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The new King James Version isn't, I'm afraid, a lot better because that says men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. Actually, risk and hazard is far too weak for this word. It's often used in the Bible as referring to a prisoner being delivered into the authority of somebody else. In fact, Young's literal translation translates it like this men who have given up their lives for the name of our lord jesus that's what the word means it means handed over their lives what a testimony of these two men these men haven't just risked their lives they've given it up they have abandoned their lives they have passed the responsibility of their lives into the hands of jesus christ for his sake for his glory now then <laughs> how many many people do you know who have given up their lives for the lord jesus i'm not talking about martyrs i'm talking about living martyrs have you have i are you beginning to get an impression of what this man was like he was a man abandoned. Listen to the response now of some of the people who met with him. This is Acts chapter 20. And when Paul had said these things, he's on his way to Jerusalem, he knelt down and prayed with them. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words that he spoke that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So what do you think about that? This doesn't sound like uh, someone who is kept at arm's length, does it? When he said to them, you won't see me again, they broke their hearts. They wept freely. They wept, the tears flowed, and they fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. This is extravagant affection. This is not the kind of affection the university lecturer gets. This is not the kind of affection that someone who is the top of a company gets. And look at this little phrase. 
they fell on his neck and kissed him. Does that little phrase sound familiar to you? It's here in Luke chapter 15. And the father arose, sorry, the, the, the son came, arose, and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Exact phrase, fell on the, his neck and kissed him. Can you imagine the passion with which that father embraced his son who was coming back? Now, this is the same phrase. This is how they said farewell to to Paul when they thought that they would never see him again. They broke their hearts over him and they loved him. They hugged him. They didn't want to let him go. They kissed him and their tears flowed into his beard. Okay. When Paul, after a couple of years, finally arrives at um, in Italy, uh, he's making his way from the port up to Rome. And Luke, who's with him, who is the, uh, the one who's doing the travel log, uh, he writes this. He says, We found brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so uh, we went towards Rome. And then he says this, And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and three inns. Whereupon, when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Literally, Paul thanked God and was emboldened. The Forum of Appius, the Appii Forum, was a small traveller's stop on the Appian Way, about 43 miles from south of Rome. It was described by Horace, a poet, uh, as crammed with boatmen and stingy tavern keepers. The Three Taverns was a stop on the Appian Way, 33 miles south of Rome. And uh, that means that these two places are about 10 miles apart. And it means that those who came from the farthest distance at Rome, about 43 miles away, they completed in all a round trip walking of 86 miles in order to meet this man off the boat to encourage him. Can you see how greatly this man was loved? And there's a little secret. You always reap what you sow. This man loved these people. He wasn't lecturing them. He wasn't wagging his finger. He was reaching his arms out to them all the time, loving them, caring for them. Okay, <laughs> almost a hundred mile round trip just to welcome him and to encourage him. Some people think preachers don't need encouragements. How far would you go to encourage the preacher? Listen to what Peter has to say about Paul. This is Peter's second letter. He's talking about salvation and he says, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul. Can you hear that again? Our beloved brother Paul. So James and the elders and the apostles at Jerusalem call him beloved. Peter calls him beloved. Our beloved brother Paul, he refers to him. We could go through the scriptures actually and uh, find all kinds of references that are scattered throughout Paul's letters of Paul's absolute givenness to the Lord and his absolute givenness to the people that he was serving. You know that he had a kind of a difficult relationship at times with the church at Corinth. But this is Paul writing in his second letter to the Corinthians, and he says, And I will very gladly <clears throat> spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less... I am loved. That's a kind of a sad note at the end of that. But listen to the first bit. I will very gladly, he says, <clears throat> not reluctantly, not grudgingly, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you. This is Paul. So what was his relationship with the church at, in, church in Galatia? Well, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, this is why we are doing this little bit. 
he says to the church at Galatia, he says, you've begun to observe, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Laboring is a word that comes often into Paul's language. This was a man who labored for the souls of men and women. This wasn't a part-time thing. This wasn't something you did on Sundays and Thursday nights. This is full-time, 24 hours, seven days a week, givenness to the care and love of these that God has trusted to his care. He says, I'm, I'm afraid for you. There's a, there's a fearfulness in his heart. He's anxious about these people. And then he goes on to say this, and it tells us a little bit that I don't think we know anywhere else quite like this. That's to say Paul's physical condition. Uh, he wasn't always kind of hale and hearty. Uh, we think he, he covered tremendous miles, and he, he, he was shipwrecked, and he was imprisoned, and we think, my, he must have been a toughie. But listen to what he says to the Galatians. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. So we know that it was as a result of an impediment of some kind that Paul had, some physical infirmity. There are clues that it may well have been um, trouble with his eyes. Maybe he had a, a permanent conviction uh, thing about his eyes. And some people put two and two together and get kind of any number you'd like to guess. And some people say, well, this was his thorn in the flesh and he, he was going blind or he was suffering from some of the effects of malaria. That's, real, that's really all speculation. This is all we know about it. We know that because of physical, physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. But listen to this. He says, but you received me as an angel of God, as to a messenger of God. And then he says, even as Christ Jesus. Do you remember what Paul says to these Galatian Christians? He says, Jesus Christ was manifest in your midst through the preaching set forth as crucified. In this man's weakness, his frailty, and yet in his determination to continue, they saw something of Christ, and it drew them to him. Listen, he goes on to say this, Have I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? Do you remember that verse in Proverbs which says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, for the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, or profuse as the word can be translated. There are some people who are all over you and they can't say enough nice things about you. And um, Jesus discovered that some of the people who were most lavish in their praise were the people who very soon their fingers were grabbling for stones. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the cases of an enemy are deceitful. Paul was determined to be faithful to these. And then he comes to this extraordinary illustration. He says, My little children, for whom I labour in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now to change my tone for I have doubt about you. He doesn't use the word beloved in Galatians, but these men and women are his beloved. He has laboured for these like a travelling mother bringing forth her children. And now they're in danger of defecting. And his reaction isn't to beat them, isn't to threaten them, isn't to abandon them and said, well, you've had your chance and you've blown it. He says, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Let me tell you a quick story, if I can. Many years ago, I went to um, Turkey to um, speak to some uh, Operation Mobilization camps of young Christians. And there was one brother there, a delightful brother, a Turk, and um, he had come to the Lord and was being very fruitful in his ministry, in his witness. And then when I came back to England, I learned sometime after that he'd, he was very ill. In fact, that he was his kidneys were failing and he was in 
desperate need. And the OM people kind of sent out um, a kind of request saying, if you want to kind of stand with this brother and help him, this is how you can kind of send some money. And Christians in, in the West, mostly I think they were, kind of sent money to um, the OM people, and he was able to have a kidney transplant, which transformed his life um, for a, a good number of years. He's with the Lord now, but for a good number of years. And then this part of the story came out. When they were seeking for a suitable kidney transfer uh, donor, they couldn't find anyone who was suitable other than his mother, who was a lady in her 60s, very simple soul, from a village in Turkey, not very educated, not very knowledgeable. And they said to her, Kenan, his name was, they said, Kenan needs a kidney. If he doesn't have a kidney, um, he will die. Would you consider being a donor? And she never hesitated. She said, yes, yes, she would give. She would, she would, she would donate the kidney that he needed. And she donated the kidney. <laughs> and Kanan was well. And then someone in the conversation with her discovered an extraordinary fact. I can hardly tell this story. They discovered that this simple lady didn't know you had two kidneys. She thought you'd only got one kidney. But she never hesitated. When her son needed a kidney, she was ready whatever the cost. That is mother love. And Paul had it. My little children, for whom I labour in birth again. How long, Paul? Until Christ is formed in you. How many times will you forgive and start again, Paul? Until Christ is formed in you. But they've done this, yes. Until Christ is formed in you. This, this, is, this is a mother's tenacious love. Abandoned love. This man has given up his life for Jesus Christ. If we went through, we'd discover that in the Corinthians, he described himself as a father. He says, you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And he says this in uh, 2 Corinthians. He says, now for the third time, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents but the parents for the children. What an amazing concept that Paul has here, that he is responsible for his children. And this is where that phrase comes from. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more I abundantly love you. So you can see what this was like, this man. Beloved, our time is gone. But this is a very precious word used constantly in the Scriptures. Uh, it's used nine times in the Gospels of Christ himself. It's used of old Israel. It's used in the New Covenant Scriptures almost 30 times in Paul's letters alone. You could make a list of all the individuals that Paul refers to by name and refers to them as Beloved. It's a, it's a phrase that sounds a little bit over the top for us. You think, oh, it's a bit gushy. It's a bit... It's, this, isn't, this isn't really the way we kind of function, is it? This is a, war, a word of deep passion and commitment. And Paul had it. And it is the secret of his relationship with the believers throughout Galatia that made it possible for him to speak strongly into their conditions, into their hearts. And I put it to you, brothers and sisters, that he earned the right to speak strong words to his brothers and sisters. We need to earn the right too. Beloved isn't a trite thing. It's a deep declaration of how precious these people are to us. I remember a man who had his critics... <laughs> And um, he said on one occasion, he said, I don't care what people 
say about me as long as they call me beloved. <laughs> um, before you criticize somebody, put beloved before their name. Not just John or Fred or whatever it is, but beloved Ron or beloved John or beloved. It'll soften, it'll soften the blow. It'll take the edge of what you're saying. Beloved, for the Lord's sake. We must stop, brothers and sisters. Thank you for spending this time with me tonight, with you and uh, other brothers and sisters throughout the world at different times. It's a joy to have you and to share these things with you. I do pray that you will think about Paul and this man and think about our Christian experience and our ministry and whether we would be willing to give up a kidney if we knew we thought it was the only one we had. Paul would. He was willing to spend and be spent. He was willing to go through it again and again and again and again and again until Christ be formed in you. This is what built the early churches. Not super powerful expositional preaching, not glorious characters who radiated everywhere they went, but love. Love in the warp and weave of their relationship together. Love it's the reason Paul speaks so strongly. He believes the love of God shed abroad in the heart of a man or a woman makes it possible to live an extraordinary life. And he proved it. Okay, thank you again for coming. And the Lord bless you. And God willing, we'll meet again for study 22. Same time, same place, next week. Bye-bye.